<laughs> morning, good morning. I'm Anne Marie Boulay on staff at this church as director of women's ministry. I'm grateful to meet, uh, greet you today. And if this is one of your first times at Wittenberry, we do pray that you'd find a place in this church family. Um, if you're joining online, please say hello. We're grateful that you're with us, and we, we do hope that you engage. You can just speak to us online. Dave Blau's over here. He's always on his little chat box, and so if you'd like to say hi or ask for a prayer, please do that. Um, after this church service, you're welcome to join us for coffee in the lobby. There's lots of specialty drinks out there. We do praise God for our connecting team. And then for those, yeah, it's a good team, and we're grateful for the caffeine in the morning. Um, <laughs> if you'd like to give us a prayer request right in your seat pocket, you can do that by just sharing what's on your heart. And in the back, there's boxes for those prayer cards. We also have a connect card. And if you'd like to get acquainted with Wintonberry, and this is one of your first times you've never shared your information, please do so on the Connect card and just give us your name and your address. We'll use that as a way to start to connect with you. Yep, I did say that already. What else do you want me to say, Bri? Hmm, I think we've covered it. Um, <laughs> we are grateful. We had a blast at Citadel of Love. We've got a really cool, I know, they were awesome. The food was amazing. It was so delicious. Andre ended up writing a song for Mama Mons, which was very tender. And Mama Mons sang to us, which was lovely and beautiful. It, the whole thing was awesome. And then Pastor Mons shared with us plans for the Citadel City, which is amazing. It's uh, over a $40 million project, and they're basically taking over like this whole area of Barber Street and rebuilding it. It was stunning, and it has been on his heart still since he became a pastor. So the whole night was awesome. Thank you for joining in that. I know it blessed Citadel, and it surely was a blessing to us. Amen. It was, it was amazing. It was awesome. Um, all right. So we have lots of announcements, uh, not a lots of announcements, but a number of things coming up. And it's just so exciting as I've been thinking about these announcements to think about all the stuff that's happening for all different types of people. Well, we've got the women's retreat coming up real soon. Praise the Lord for that. So if you haven't registered, please make sure. We've got a men's event coming up, men's service day, this coming Saturday, April 13th. Uh, we're gonna, the men are going to work around the campus in the morning and then serve at South Park in Homeless Shelter in the late afternoon. Details are on the website if you want to register. There's also details behind me. So, fellas, come on out. Great opportunity to fellowship. Great opportunity to serve and just bless both the church and outside the church. So that's exciting. So we've got men's. We've got women's. Uh, we've also got uh, our children. We've got the Joy of Giving stuff happening downstairs, as well as our Dominican Republic mission trip is coming up. We've got eight high school students and four adults that are going to be going this coming summer, and we're right now in the process of fundraising. So we want to tell you about some fundraisers coming up. Uh, one is coming up on uh, April 20th, okay, from 5.30 to 8 p.m., and, uh, and, and then the second one is May 18th, from, it says 2 to 4, but I think, I think doors open at 1.30. Um, both of them are paint parties. Uh, so Virginia Brown puts on these amazing paint parties. My daughter has gone to one of them, my oldest daughter, Bethany, and she said that she had just such a fun time uh, just learning how to paint and enjoying painting and fellowshipping with other people. Um, all the proceeds from these events go towards our DR missions team and our mission trip. Uh, so that's exciting. So again, uh, the first one in April is for anybody. Um, and we're also opening it up if uh, parents want to come and have kind of a special date night. We're also going to have uh, youth here to watch over children and things like that. So great opportunity to come and enjoy painting, having some fun time. And uh, your children will have a place where they can go and have a good time as well. Um, and on, on, in May, May 18th, that's more of a, of a women's event for fellowship and connection and stuff like that. So that's when we want to encourage you as well. Uh, this fundraiser is for the first event that's downstairs. Uh, there's a flyer, that is. There's going to be a flyer for the other event downstairs soon. So keep an eye out. It's, a, it's got a 
QR code to tell you how you can uh, register for it. But again, uh, it's all going towards the uh, DR missions trip this summer, which is happening July 8th, to, sorry, July 28th to August 4th. So we're really excited about being able to serve down at the DR again, um, and we're excited about the uh, team that we've got going. So. Thanks, Bri. Um, we're going to pray, but that was a whole lot of good things. Um, ladies, don't forget, today's the last day to sign up for retreat. Let's pray. <laughs> I had to squeeze that in. Yep. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your love in our life, your light in our life, the forgiveness you have blessed us with, the freedom on the other side. We're so grateful to you, Lord, and you are welcome in this house. Your spirit, we pray, would dwell here. Father God, so many good things. Thank you for letting us stand with Citadel of Love. It was such a blessing to be in their house, Lord, and to experience a little bit of worship and the honoring that went on there. Thank you uh, for this good church. And we do pray with them that your will and your purposes will be fulfilled in the Citadel City, Lord. We just praise you for this good new thing that you're bringing to Har Barber Street and to Hartford. Lord, we pray for the DR fundraiser. We thank you so much for these paint nights and for the ways that we can gather to support the DR missions trip. And we pray you go before them and prepare them and do provide all that they need. And lastly, Lord, thank you for the work that's going to be done by the men in, a, in just a few days, Lord, in both this campus and at South Park Inn. Um, see, that's where you shine through us, Lord, when we just do the things that we were born to do. So we just praise you for all of this good news. Thank you for the Easter season, Lord. We pray your will be done today. We love you so much, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Morning, Winberry. Morning. I love coming here on Communion Sunday, and I think about the Last Supper and the attitude and posture of Jesus towards his disciples. I was actually reading it again this morning, and it says that they, they were in the midst of their meal. They hadn't finished eating yet, and he decided to wash their feet, which would usually happen right at the door as you came in, but he decided to kind of make this statement of, of servitude and humility towards these men who he loved and knew would be serving him um, in spreading the gospel. And it's just a, such a cool scene to think of our Savior and the humility that he embraced in order to serve us and to love us. So I'd really like to, to sing, to stand, uh, to worship together. So let's stand if you can and uh, join us in, uh, in singing and worshiping. See me through. 
God the King And it makes my heart want to sing I can sing through the troubled times Sing when I win I can sing when I lose my step And fall down again I can sing cause you Sing cause you're there I can sing cause you hear me Lord When I call to you in prayer I can sing with my last breath I sing for I know That I'll sing with the angels and the saints around the throne From singing your praise, how can I ever say enough? How amazing is your love? How can I keep from shouting your name? I know I am loved by the King, and it makes my heart. I am loved by the King. And it makes this heart again I am loved by the King And it makes my heart want to see Lift him up in praise He is the King We are loved by the King of Kings Amen Jesus, 
this time together. Thank you for the Lord's Supper. I want to invite Matt Allen to come up and, uh, and direct us in that together. Good morning, Whitberry. Hi, I'm Matt Allen. I'm, uh, and you guys can be seated right now. Sorry. Um, uh, I'm Matt Allen. I'm one of the elders here. Uh, one of the honors I have to do this. Um, and um, Andre kind of prompted me towards something this, this week to say, and uh, it really kind of got me off on looking, um, looking out there and kind of researching and, and getting deeper into uh, communion. Um, and reading and preparing for this morning, I stumbled upon kind of a new notion for me. And I wanna, I wanna share kind of this thought of, there's, when I think of communion, I kind of get stuck with this vertical view. It's between me, it's between God, and it's between what we share, right? And that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. We want that as part of this. But I also want to kind of have us think about something that I really hadn't thought of, which is this horizontal perspective. And I'm gonna kind of use Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17 to kind of start as a baseline for that. Because when you jump into the next chapter, that's where all the good stuff about communion is, right? All the, all the stuff that you're familiar with. But we kind of, I kind of always kind of missed this piece of it. So his words kind of prompted me into looking deeper for something like this. So uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17 starts with the cup of blessing that we give thanks for. Is it not a sharing in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a sharing in the body of Christ? So that... Again, not a concept that we're not unfamiliar with. And then here's the piece that really stood out to me in 17. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body. For all of us share that one bread. So I think many of us think of the Lord's Supper again as this intensified private devotion. Um, I go to church, I hear the word, I, um, I eat the bread, I drink the wine, I'm reminded of Christ's death, Christ's death and the forgiveness of my sins, and then I go home. Um, for most of us as Christians, though, that, that's as far as we go when it comes to putting together the Lord's Supper in the local church. Um, but celebrating the Lord's Supper together is an essential step in making a church a church. Um, in a very significant sense, the Lord's Supper is the moment when a group of Christians becomes one body. The Lord's Supper makes many one and, and again, if you go back to, Andre talks about it all the time, when Paul repeats himself, that's the part where you really want to be focused on. He starts with, you know, at that, in that verse, I'll go back to verse 17, he says, because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for all of us share that one bread. It's kind of like when my parents have to repeat to me when I was younger to do something correctly. It's like Paul always trying to like drive the point home. So when he says it twice, he's kind of saying, hey guys, maybe you want to pay attention to this. 
So um, with all that said, um, we're gonna invite you forward to collect the elements up front, bring them back to your seats where we will take them together. Everything is now gluten-free, so you don't have to worry about what you're grabbing. Uh, if you're unable to come forward, just raise your hand and someone will bring the elements to you. So I'm gonna invite, um, I think there's two elders, are gonna, Bob and Chris are gonna come up and hand out the elements here. And there they are. And uh, Eric's gonna lead us, as you guys are coming up, Eric's gonna lead us in another song. And I will, and the music will play me off the stage and I'll be back.
light of the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see this beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am say that you're my God, you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So, with all of that being said, we're going to do this now together. Um, so, the bread represents the body of Christ broken for our healing. So, you can take that now. And the cup symbolizes the blood of Christ shed for the forgiveness of sins. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to focus on the unity that your supper symbolizes. Help us to remember that we are one in you and in Christ. The shed blood and the broken body of Christ make that oneness possible. And that our partaking together of the elements makes that oneness vi vis visible. Amen. In the spirit of our oneness, just turn and greet the person next to you as the children are dismissed.
Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, wait, I've got one right there. All right. Uh, all right, let's come back together. Thank you very much. Herding cats. Herding cats. Actually, that was pretty good. Normally, it takes more than that, so good job. Before we go any further this morning, we do have one more thing to share with you, and uh, this Wednesday is our third spring trimester of Wednesday Night Live, so I'd like to call up the facilitators right now. Bob, you should have sat up here today, bro, and all this stuff you're doing. <laughs> So if I call the facilitators up, that would be great. And um, we'll just get in a line. Let me grab the mic here. All right, so every trimester we offer four classes. We have four tracks in Wednesday Night Live. Uh, this is an, uh, just a discipleship opportunity to grow. We, we meet for dinner at six. And we invite you to come even if you're not taking a class. It's a great opportunity for community. And then we worship at about quarter of and pray, and then we go to classes from 7 to 8.30. These classes are free. There's no cost to them. There's free will offering if you would like to help us defray costs. Um, if you do that QR code with your phone right now, you can actually go right to the registration page. Um, but we're going to talk forth uh, each of these. These are all designed for people who are at different places in their spiritual journey. Some of us are just at the beginning. Some of us are way down the line. Some of us are in between. Wherever you are, if you can find a place, uh, we'd love to have you. So let's start with Bob Lorario developing a spiritual formation. Tell us why we should take your class and who's it for. Uh, good morning, church. Well, morning. of course uh, you should take it because Andre just said you should. <laughs> no, in actuality, it's, it's a, a wonderful class. It's designed ready, for um, new believers, but really for anyone who put their faith in Christ uh, a week ago to someone who put their faith in Christ 10 years ago or 30 years ago. We all want to grow closer to Christ. And how do we do that? We develop our spiritual foundation. Um, what does that mean? Uh, is it about emotional experiences? Is it about serving? Is it about uh, Bible study, uh, prayer? Is it about setting ourselves away from the world as a monk does and get away from the stain of sin and those things? You know, or, or is it about um, getting together in the community, being part of a church, um, being part of life groups, small groups? Um, what does that mean, to develop your spiritual foundation? In this class, we're going to dive into that. We're going to see what God's Word says about that. And it's going to be a great time. So I hope you all can come join. So that's particularly for people who are newer to the faith, exploring the faith, wanting to know what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Bethany Sullivan and I are going to co-teach Knowing the Truth Christian Theology. Bethany, you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so it's, um, it's a really cool, uh, I was very blessed when Andre asked me to teach because I think, you know, we were created to be uh, strong and deep thinkers. God created us with minds to think. And so this class is basically going to go through the historical doctrine of Christianity. So we will look at um, theology, we will look at... Uh, how the Bible came to be and why it is authoritative. We're going to look at each of the persons of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We're going to look at salvation. We're going to look on how sin has affected humanity. Um, and we're just going to dive deep. It's going to be discussion-based, mm -hmm. which means, you know, there is no room for, um, for any wrong questions. It's going to be a place where we can talk freely and go yeah. back to scripture and see what it says. Um, we are also, Andre's read this book a ton of times and I've started reading it. Know the Truth, Know the Truth by Bruce Milner. Um, it's a great book and it just lays everything out so clearly. So I'm really excited for this class and it's for anyone that is wanting to dive deeper into their faith and know the background of why the church is where it is and why we believe the things that we do. And we're even going to take a deep dive into why Wittenberry has chosen to the, believe the things that we do. So it's going to be a great opportunity to have discussions with other people that are seeking um, to grow in their knowledge of doctrine and then their knowledge of faith. So it's going to be really cool. I'm excited. Me too. I'm excited too to teach with you. <laughs> Bethany uh, has a degree in Christian ministry, Bible, uh, and uh, Bible theology. So together, I think we're going to have fun doing this. Gospel-centered life. What is that, Dave LeBlanc? So um, I'll give a description. In um, 
the ch chapter one of Paul's letter to, to the Colossians, he commends them by saying this. He says, the gospel is continually bearing fruit and increasing in and among us. That can and should be true of us too, right? This study will help us live to learn, live, learn to live the gospel, live as ambassadors for Christ in everyday life. Amen. It's not about how good we live this Christian life. Amen. It's about growing in humility and usefulness for the Lord. Amen. We'll look at how we view God and how we view ourselves in light of the gospel. The gospel will shape every aspect of our lives if we allow it to, but it's not automatic. As Andre has said before, we need to preach the gospel to ourselves every day. Amen. Well, we'll have fun in this class. If you have any questions, let me know. Please join us. If you struggle with being good enough, if you struggle with beating yourself up, this class is for you. And let's get uh, the Blombergs. Hello. <laughs> um, so Andre said, why should you take this class? It's easy. We'll just give you money. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> But, um, that always works. This, um, this book is a great book. It's by Michael Blue, Ron Blue's son. Um, that's why I'm talking right now, because it's the son's talking about it, his son. Yeah, yeah. Uh, father, I'm son. Blue. Yeah. yeah. Um, but um, this book really helps talk about financial hope, and the whole purpose of the book is to talk about how our hope isn't found in our financial situation. It's found in God, right? Um, money is a terrible master. If we try to serve it, it never goes well. Mm -hmm. um, so this book, it, he talks about how Paul in his letter to the Philippians tells us that he has lived in wealth and in poverty and that his contentment wasn't dependent on either circumstance but entirely dependent on his trust in God. So that's the important thing that we find in this class is not to put our hope in our finances. Amen. Amen. And so, you know, we think we're united in Christ, right? <laughs> but we're also united in the fact that we handle money every day of our lives. That's true. We're dealing with it. We read about it. We spend it. We save it. We're, we're dealing with it all the time. And God has over 2,300 verses in the Bible about money. So he, I would encourage you to come wherever you are in your life, ever, wherever you are in your walk of life, to come and hear what God has to say about money. Amen. Can we thank God for the old willing to teach and facilitate? <laughs> so, Father, we just pray for each person now as they are just before you saying, Lord, are you calling me to take one of these over the next nine weeks. Lord, if in fact that's the case, help people to, to, to make that step in commitment. And Lord, if not, that's fine too. But Father, we would just wanna see people take their next step, next step in their walk and journey with you into grace, into solid theology, to create a solid foundation so we can make good decisions with things like money. Lord, it all connects, it all connects. And so Father, speak to each one of us and Lord, now as we go into your word, which is so precious, so perfect, so good, help us, Lord, to humble our hearts before your scripture, and Lord, begin to do, continue to do the work of, of shaping us into your humble servants for your great glory. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody. I want to hold on to that for the next few weeks. Yeah. So let me ask you, how many of you have done ballroom dancing? Anybody? I'm just curious. Ballroom dancing. Okay, so quite a, quite a few of you actually, not too bad. Well, Diane and I have done ballroom dancing too, and I'll tell you, it's hard. It's really hard. And you know, and the hardest part of it is, is when neither one knows what they're supposed to do. And when the person doesn't lead right and the person doesn't follow right, it just is a complete mess. And that's exactly what it's like in marriage in the church as well. When the leading and following doesn't go well, it is a mess. And I make that analogy because of our dear friend Margie Schock, who is our administrator here at Winterberry, and her and her late husband Tom taught me such a valuable lesson because they taught ballroom dancing. And they were expert ballroom dancers. These are pictures Margie gave me this week. And they would often do it and teach on marriage at the same time because they saw an amazing analogy. And, and the analogy was basically this, that in ballroom dancing, the man is to lead and the woman is to follow. 
And for the dance to go well, they each have to do their part. If either one takes the other part, it falls apart. And the interesting thing is this. If the leading and following is done correctly, the man fades in the background, and it's the woman who shines. And a matter of fact, they, they said that in competition, the man will be told to wear something that's very nondescript, and the woman wears something that's really extravagant and beautiful. Why? Because the point is to make her shine. The whole point of the man's leading is that his wife would shine. And when they do it well together, it is a beautiful dance. And I think that analogy, like Tom and Margie said, is a perfect one to biblical marriage and how God wants his church to operate. I think about the words of the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter five when he was speaking to husbands. He commanded them this way. He said, husbands, this is how you lead. Love your wives. Just as Christ loved his church and gave himself up for her to present her, why? To present her to himself as a radiant church. That's how Jesus led his bride and that's how the scripture tells husbands to lead their wives, but it's for the purpose that they might shine. And ultimately, it's that God would be glorified. That's how God wants Christian marriage to operate. That's how he wants the church to operate with its leaders and followers as well. And when we lead and follow well, it is a beautiful dance. We're in a, our sermon series on the book of 1 Timothy. I called it Spiritual Treasure because that's what Paul says the gospel is. That's what this book is all about is the gospel. The good news that we can be right with God through faith in Christ of no merit of our own. It's a treasure but it's being, it's, it's being threatened in Ephesus by some false teachers who are redefining the gospel and redefining how it is being lived out. Now, Paul knows that the, unity, God, the, the gospel's unity and purity hinges on how the church conducts itself as the bride of Christ. That's what he says in his letter. Later on in chapter three, I've shared this a few times, he says this, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Conduct. Why is he so concerned about the conduct? Because in the ancient world, pagan worship was typified by complete out of control assemblies, lots of sensual expression, and excessive wine because the thinking was you would have a mystical experience under the influence of wine. Paul wants to offer a contrast to that chaos. So he spends chapter two saying this is what Christian worship, when pagans look in, this is what they should see. They should see order. The reputation of the gospel's on the line. And so he tells the men, stop arguing with each other in worship like the pagans do. And he says, women, I want you to learn and without disruption. Again, opposite of what the pagans did. And then in the midst of that, he assigns the various dance roles. And he says men are to have the authoritative teaching in the public assembly, that role. And now having said that, again, his focus is on order. Why? He points back to creation. He points back to the order of creation and the way God intended it at the beginning. And that's where we left off last time. And that's where I want to pick up because now the question is, well, how are we to lead? But before I go any further, now, as you know, if you were here a couple weeks ago, there was a lot to go through in those verses. I never got the application, and I left that up to the Sermon Engagement app, and unfortunately, not many look at that, and those who did said, boy, it'd be good if you shared some of that. So, in deference to them, that's what I want to do this morning, and in particular, the one thing that was mentioned the most is the policy that we have as a church on the affirmation of women in ministry. And in that policy, we go through, again, the biblical principles I already went over uh, in the sermon, in my paper, seminary paper. And then there's a whole section on application. And let me just show you this application. This is, if men are supposed to be the authoritative, authoritative teachers in the public assembly, then what does that mean for women? So this puts out some of those applications. Number one, women are welcome to exercise their gifts in nearly all ministry contexts, including associate staff leadership. Now, heart complimentary wouldn't allow that, but we do here in soft because we don't see the restriction outside of Sunday morning. So that includes things like Anne Marie, 
who is associate staff member, director of women's ministry, Ruth Brown, director of connections, Margie, administrator, and others. And then significant ministry leaders like Judy Carson and Lori Blomberg, who lead Freedom Prayer for us, and Judy Bowman, who leads the deacons with our husband Jim, and others. Number two, women can lead public worship, and they do. We got Renee Story, Mel O'Shea, and many others over the years who've led worship. Um, number three, women can lead and teach in small groups like life groups, mixed settings, Sunday school classes, and schools such as Winterbury School of Ministry, which is now known as Wednesday Night Live, and they do. Uh, Candace taught with me in the fall. My wife taught with me last trimester, uh, trimester and then Bethany is going to be teaching with me this one, and, and women have led her their own. They're unrestricted there in terms of teaching. And then women can baptize, and they have here at Winterbury. So I'm, I'm hoping what you see here is that what our heart is, our heart is to release the arrows. We want, each one of you is fashioned by God, and we want to release you into what God's called you to. Our mission statement is to seek to help individuals and communities experience God, become more like Jesus, discover their calling, and impact their world. And we're very serious about that. Um, that's why we offer the Kingdom Calling class, and it's for men and women. We want people to find their calling and then to pursue it. And in almost every case, people can pursue their callings right here at Wintonbury. But in some cases, either because of the, the nature of the call is international, you know, or, or national or regional, they have to go outside Wintonbury, or because of a restriction, we find other ways to, for the people to use those gifts, and we do all we can to encourage those gifts and fan them in the flame as much as we possibly can. So the bottom line is we can partner on the non-essentials and then we find ways that we can bring forth the gospel with the giftings God's given. And that goes for men, women, and children, actually. So please come and talk to us, elders, staff, uh, other leaders, if you have questions or if you'd like to discover your calling and then get launched out. We would love to come under you and put wind under your wings so that you can glorify God with what God's called you to do. So in light of that, the question then at the end of chapter two is, well then, who should be leading? What does leadership look like? We need a good lead dance partner. If that person doesn't lead well, the dance doesn't go well. So we get some descriptions of what a good dance partner looks like in 1 Timothy chapter three. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn there, 1 Timothy chapter three. And again, Paul is just, it's just natural now Having talked about what the church service should look like, now in chapter three, he's shifting gears and he's talking about leadership. And he starts with what he calls overseers. Overseers. So let's read that. First Timothy chapter three, verse one. Here is a trustworthy saying. Whoever aspires to be an overseer desires a noble task. Now the overseer is to be above reproach faithful to his wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him, and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Because if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. So the first thing Paul affirms here is in terms of church leadership is that uh, this is a noble task. It's a noble task. It's something worth aspiring to. And the word here for overseer is interesting. It's episcope, which is where we get episcopal from. Um, and it's basically synonymous with the word Paul uses uh, in the book of Titus, where he also puts forth qualities of an elder. There he calls them elder. The only difference is, is that elder was more of a Jewish word. It was the word used in the synagogue for the one who was overseeing everything. And then overseer, episcope, was more of a Greek word that was used of shepherding a group of people of some kind to a particular purpose. So if you put that together, that's what these elders or overseers are called to do. They're called to shepherd God's people on behalf of Jesus Christ. They are under shepherds to the chief shepherd. So 
Paul actually describes this function of shepherding when he talks to the Ephesian elders in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 20. He describes it like this. He says to them, keep watch, Ephesian elders, over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now note, this isn't a glamorous CEO, corner office, you know, corporate gig. Shepherding is smelly, it's dirty, it can be lonely out on the hillside. It's hard work. It is hard work. I like how one commentator uh, described this ministry of eldership. He says, it's not a dreamy-eyed advancement to a posh appointment. It's enlistment in a duty that is always exacting and often thankless. Oversight means loving, caring concern. It's a responsibility willingly shouldered. It must never be used for personal aggrandizement. So leadership, contrary to how we think of it, is a heavy, heavy burden with big responsibility. Now, I didn't realize that when I was a young man and I wanted to be an elder, which, which, I, which I did desperately when I was a young guy. I aspired to it, which is good, but my problem is I had some mixed motives. I, I wanted the esteem of being an elder, right? I wanted uh, the, the title, elder, and God had to humble me. And now, I've been on the elder board for 27 years and any of that luster that I thought was there has you know, gone away a long time ago. I can, I can assure you of that. And I'll never forget when Rich retired, I said to him, what are you most looking forward to? He goes, not going to elder board meetings anymore. <laughs> 40 years of elder board meetings. It wasn't because he, 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 didn't, he didn't see it as an honor, because he did. It's because it's exhausting. And it's heavy, it's heavy. You know, several commentators mentioned that Paul may have written this verse because no one wanted to be in that office. Here was what one uh, scholar said. I thought this was actually very interesting. The false teaching in Ephesus, the heresy they're dealing with, may have spawned a distrust for leaders and a reluctance to take up the responsibilities that that kind of leadership required. In other words, be careful what you wish for. You might just get it. So with that said... Paul then lays down 15 qualifications that should make anyone reading it shake in their shoes, right? And he starts off with seven positive ones in verses two and three. The first one here is he says he should be above reproach. Generally, that means he should have a good reputation. Uh, it doesn't mean he's perfect and his resume has nothing, but he's got a good resume, a good reputation, someone you can depend on. Um, that's the first one, that no major scandals. And that one acts like an umbrella. What does above reproach look like? Well, now it's kind of all the rest. The second one is literally, it said, my version says faithful to his wife. The literal Greek is a one woman man. What does a one woman man mean? And there's been great debate about that throughout church history, actually. It goes way back. There are four common suggestions of what this could mean. This phrase in the Greek, one woman man. It could mean the man has to be married. But it doesn't actually say must in the text. That's kind of reading into it. The second possibility is it mean the man must be married to just one woman right now. In other words, not a polygamist. But in that society, at this time, polygamy was almost non-existent. It's like saying, don't be a cannibal. It's just not an issue. There's no reason to bring it up. Actually, Roman law had outlawed polygamy by this point. The third one is, the man must be married to just one woman ever. In other words, never divorced or widowed. There is some evidence that the early church believed that. But the issue there is, Paul never says that it's wrong to be widowed. And there are obviously legitimate times of divorce. So why would that be a stigma? And then the fourth one uh, is the man must not have mistresses, which were extremely common in Greco-Roman society. I personally think it's probably that fourth one, 
and the reason, now very conservative people might go with three. I think four makes more sense, and here's why. I like what Kent Hughes said in his commentary. He said that when you look at the verses two and three, it's all character traits. It's, it's so, this is, we should be thinking of one woman man from a qualitative, not a quantitative basis. That kind of persuades me, and that's where you get a, a translation like this, faithful to his wife. It's a list of character traits. He should be faithful. So, regardless, wherever you land there. The third one is temperate. He should be temperate. Temperate means somebody who is balanced, someone who's clear-headed, who's not gonna be reactive in, in difficult situations. Then he says he should be self-controlled, meaning he should be restrained, he, he should be measured. It's the same word that Paul uses for women in chapter two about being modest. It's about being restrained and balanced. And then he says they should be respectable. The word there in the Greek is the same word that we get the word order from. They should be ordered. In other words, their bills should be paid. When you go to their house, it shouldn't be chaos. They take care of their things. They're ordered people. So they can order their home. They can order the church. And then it says they should be hospitable, meaning they should be welcoming to everyone and anyone. Elders should not be aloof people. They should be greeting and hospitable. And number seven, this is actually the only one that's a skill. They should be able to teach. Literally, it's what the, uh, it says. Able to teach, which means they need to be sound doctrinally. They need to be able to handle the word of God because they're gonna be dealing with false teaching. They need to be able to identify false teaching and then know how through the scripture to, to address that and to protect the sound doctrine. That's a huge, huge task for elders. So those are the seven positive ones. Then he goes into four negative ones. Um, actually, in verse three, he goes into four negative things to avoid. And the first one is he should not be given to drunkenness. And actually, the Greek here is interesting. The Greek is literally sit beside wine. He shouldn't be just constantly imbibing, you know, and it could be any addictive uh, substance or behavior. He shouldn't be somebody who's just uh, acts in an addictive way. The next one, he shouldn't be, not violent, he should be gentle. And that doesn't mean that he should be a pushover and you can just, you know, say anything you want and put them, but he handles those who disagree with him graciously. And similarly, they should not be quarrelsome. This is similar. It shouldn't be people who get in the fights all the time. They should be peacemakers. Their natural reaction is not to get defensive, it's to seek peace. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is a big deal in Ephesus with all these false teachers that they're constantly dealing with, people opposing them all the time. How do they react when they're opposed? He wants them to be people who can balance grace and truth like Jesus did beautifully. I love what Paul writes to Timothy in the second letter. Timothy must be getting frustrated with the false teachers because Paul tells him this. He says, and listen carefully, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth. That is so powerful. You know, you can tell if someone's walking in the spirit by how they handle someone who opposes them. Flesh or spirit, you can see it. Then the fourth and last thing they're told to avoid is they should not be greedy for money. And that just means they should be responsible, but they shouldn't be just motivated by money. You know, a lot of times in churches, successful businessmen are usually elevated to elder, but listen, business wisdom and spiritual wisdom are not the same thing. And the church is not a business, it is a people, it is a family. It needs spiritual leadership as well as, you know, wisdom and logistics as well. So from there, he then shifts from these characteristics. Now he shifts to family life and looks at the elder's family life, verses four and five. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. I mean, he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. Because if anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? That makes sense, right? But I don't know a man who's ever been an elder who reads those verses without shaking in their shoes. Because I've yet to meet a perfect father. 
and I've yet to see a perfect family. So who in the world can qualify? Well, a couple things. The word for children is technon. That's the word for a child up to the age of adolescence. Once they were past adolescence, they're adults. And he's, they're being told, does he manage his family well? It doesn't say, does he control his family well? We can't control our kids' choices once they get past adolescence, but we can manage well. And the question is, have you prayed? Have you taken care? Have you loved? Have you provided? And if the answer is yes, then you've managed well. And that's one reason why we interview wives whenever we consider a potential elder. What's the family life like? And then the last two things he brings up are specific situations. Uh, verse six, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. And he must also have a good reputation with outsiders so he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. The devil was judged for what? You remember? Pride. He wanted the position, right? And he ended up falling hard. That's what he's getting at. A recent convert who, who is elevated to elder because maybe he's charismatic or very successful in life or whatever. We're just setting them up for that same prideful fall. We don't want to do that. We get puffed up in pride. And then in verse 7, we go, we, Paul comes full circle. He started with above reproach, good reputation, and then he ends. But now he's saying they should have a good rep reputation not only among us inside the church, but outside the church. And when they do, it is a beautiful thing. It's interesting. One commentator, Gordon Fee, I thought he made an interesting thought where it says he will f not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap if he has a good reputation with outsiders. Bringing disgrace to the church. That can happen through individual elders, pastors making, and we've seen it, right? I don't need to list names. Horrible decisions that bring the whole church into disgrace. Or it can be when we as believers fight with one another instead of learn how to, to love one another. When we infight, the devil's like, I got them right where I want them. That's the devil's trap, to get us so busy fighting each other that we're not busy at what we're supposed to be doing, preaching the gospel to a lost world. He says the important thing is to have a good reputation. The word for good, kalas, is the same word for beautiful, a beautiful reputation, a beautiful reputation. And when the leading and following are done well, it's beautiful. And the whole world sees it, and they say, tell me about your God. So being an elder <laughs> is a very high privilege, but a tremendously high bar and a tremendously high burden of responsibility we will answer to God for. When I think of leadership, what comes to my mind immediately is this. That's leadership. You want to be a leader? Get up on a cross. At Iron Sharpens Iron, one of the speakers said, if you aren't bleeding, you aren't leading. Leading and sacrifice go together. And the point of the sacrifice is for the ones you're leading. So men, are you leading like Jesus? You elders who've been called into leadership, are you leading like Jesus sacrificially? And church, are you following, not making it difficult for, for the elders to lead, the ones who've been called to lead? I love what the writer of Hebrews says to the church. This is to us. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they episkopos, they shepherd, they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. So do this following so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. So if I can just uh, wrap up my part here this morning by asking you, would you do me just one application this morning. Would you pray for our elders? These are our current elders right now. We also have ones who've been elders before. At Winterbury, elder once, elder for life. But these are the men who are currently meeting, praying, serving, sacrificing for you. Would you pray for them? It's a heavy burden, decision making and all of that. Let, our commitment is to, is, to follow, is to lead like Jesus led, sacrificially. And pray for that. And I would ask you to follow. And when we do that, it becomes like Margie and Tom, a beautiful, beautiful dance 
that causes the church, the loved ones to shine and for God to be glorified. Now, one of those dancers is Amory Belay, our director of women's ministries. And I'd like to have the balance of the morning now be left to Amory to come up and share with you a little bit about what it's been like for her, her story of being a woman leader here at Winterbury under the covering of the elders who've sought to lead her. So would you please welcome our sister Amory. I love you. Hello. Does this work or? Good morning, good morning. I'm wearing a laptop. If not, I'm gonna take the hand up. You can hear me? Oh, I can't hear myself. Can you stand up, Brian? It's okay. Wow, well, thank you, Andre. Yeah, I hear me now. Um, I really appreciated your preaching. And I was, Andre shared what he was going to teach this morning with me yesterday. And after I read it, I thought, yeah, I agree with all that he has said about the elders. Um, because they are men who are, I pray, above reproach. That is a big deal. But who cover ministries in great ways in this church. And certainly, I would not be in ministry without the elders of this church or our pastors. So... I definitely appreciated the illustration of this kind of dance thing, um, and I agree. And I'm up here because a couple of weeks ago, we heard from Andre the teaching that he referred to in um, 1 Timothy chapter 2 when it comes to women and their role in the church. And obviously, I have a significant one, um, and I love the women of our church, right? And I... Uh, always knew where Andre stood when it came to women in the church and our role and the role of our brothers in Christ. And, but I'd never heard it delivered quite like that. And I just want to say to our beautiful women, you know, you, there are so many he spoke about who lead. And you are loved and you are valued and there's roles that you have here. And I serve with 14 other women in order to lead women's ministry. And they're all leaders and very gifted, very talented. So when I prayed about standing before you, because I asked him if I could stand with him in this message, um, mainly because I love this church, right? And obviously have been here for quite some time. When I was praying and praying about what I could share God brought me all the way back to when I became a believer in Jesus Christ, and that was through a message about the Samaritan woman at the well, which is found in the book of John, chapter 4, where Jesus tells her everything that she's about. I heard this preached. I so identified with the woman at the well. I was 33 at the time. It was 1996, and I remember being like, wow, <laughs> wow this Lord has living water for me. And that's the day I became a Christ follower. And I'll tell you, I had a radical transformation through Jesus Christ. It was beautiful. I, was, I lived a lot of life at 33. I had a lot of sin. And I needed that forgiveness. I needed his living water. It was like an awesome thing to be free. Um, and the other piece about this woman is after she left Jesus, she went off to the city and you know, I would have to get another hour to tell you about it all, but she basically gave the people that were in front of her the message that she received from Jesus, and they wanted to know who he was because they knew who she was before she met him, and she changed, right? And so that's part of my story, and Andre knows it. I love, I am a messenger of God's word, and these were Samaritans that converted as Christ followers, and that I love to be a messenger of God's word. So in that space, and from that point of view, I'm just gonna keep telling you my story. Uh, in 96 through 2001, I had a great life. I, I mean, it didn't change. <laughs> I still have a great life, but it changed dramatically, right, in, in my values. I loved my husband so much. I was, uh, a, I loved my daughter. It was my world. I also was deeply in love with Jesus Christ. And I uh, had three female friends who discipled me for years and taught me how to study the Word of God. 
and it was beautiful. Uh, the more I learned about Jesus, the more I came alive. I mean, I can't even explain my transformation in Christ, but it was awesome. I was also a businesswoman, and I was very successful. I mean, I had powerful positions in large corporations. I ran Northeast divisions um, in various departments. I was called, my boss would call me his superstar. Of course, I love that. Um, <laughs> and I also, you know, got a lot of awards for my accomplishments. I made great money. My last job was a sales rep in corporation in the third largest pharmaceutical chain in the country. And I enjoyed, you know, great success. I really did. At the same time, I was constantly praying to the Lord because I tell you what, I wanted to serve him. There's just no question. I was all in for Jesus. Anyways, I'm praying and I've got this great career. And then I bring a $1.5 million deal to the table, which was a lot of, you know, it was a good sale in that day. And I remember the corporate office saying, we don't want it, you know, and they did not let me close it. And I realized, wow, they've really shifted their goals and I'm going to have to think about something else. So I left that corporate position and I, in prayer, kept asking the Lord, what can I do, Lord? What can I do? And I had some expertise and essentially I moved into my own business. I came from a family of entrepreneurs and I just decided, hey, I'm, I'm going to go for it. And I became an entrepreneur. And I, my business was called Senior Care. Look. I asked the Lord in a prayer, don't ever pray like this, but I did. <laughs> I go to the Lord, Lord Jesus, uh, please bless this business and please let me make a lot of money. Just, and I'll just do it for three years and I promise you, whatever you want me to do, I will do it for you, Lord Jesus, at the end of the three years. That was essentially my prayer. Teresa, my daughter, was our daughter was about to start college and it's expensive and we did need income from me, right? And not that Brian wasn't doing beautifully, but at any rate, that was my prayer. The Lord did bless that business. It was hugely lucrative. Uh, I mean, anything I could ever have wanted, it was like mine. It, it, it seemed like everything I touched turned to gold. It was good. It was good. And God was all in it, and I was always giving him the glory. Um, we, that church that I became a Christ follower in, we ended up leaving in 2002. And this is how we got to Wittenberry. Um, we had friends here who were part of the worship team who were from that old church. And I loved to sing to the Lord. And anyways, this day, we, we looked for a church for a whole year. And every time I would stand in a church, I would weep. I'd be like, this isn't my church home. You know, I was a mess. I was grieving. And then a, a year, my husband took me everywhere. We went everywhere, every kind of denomination. And then we came to Wittenberry. And look, we live in Massachusetts. And I remember driving down 10 and 202, kind of yelling at uh, Brian, like, why are we going all the way to Wittenberry? I mean, it's so far away. And we haven't tried this church or this church or this church. So all the way down 10 and 202, Brian's listening to me. And he just keeps driving. He's like, you're good. We'll have a good time. Anyways, and that particular weekend, I really feel, felt like Jesus had really healed and sealed me in a particular way. I mean, I have been, this was a new level of healing for me. And I just wanted to worship God. We got here. Um, we walked in, and it was the first time I ever felt like I had been home. And it was instant. It was no issue. And we sat sort of in the middle there, um, and Rich Ainsworth shook our hand before the service. And then Andre gets up here. All I wanted to do was praise Jesus. That was my head and heart, and that's why Brian brought us here. And then Andre's up here being himself. He goes, we're going to praise Jesus today, you know, Hallelujah. And I'm like, oh, they must do this every week. And, <laughs> <laughs> but these were the ways God was affirming, this is your church. You have found your home now. Good. We are here now. Then, you know, look, we loved the way Rich preached. I, I had never heard before a translation of Hebrew and Greek. I, I just didn't, not just that, but how to apply it in life. And I cared about it. But then I heard Andre preach. 
And he spoke. I had already been baptized. It was about five months later. I'm still praying about, Lord, what do you have? He spoke about a beautiful letdown. And he shared that Jesus invites us to sacrificially join him in joy, joyously ushering in the kingdom of God over all of the earth. And then he talked about how he heard from the Lord. And I said, I hear from the Lord like that too. I want to meet this Andre. So we set up a date and he was kind enough to let me come to his office. And I shared what God was. He was moving in me. God was calling me. I see it in my Bible how the Lord, I'm telling God, I'll go anywhere for you. I'll do anything just to preach your word and your gospel. So I'm telling Andre, he was, he was preparing to leave for seminary at the time. We would meet four more times over four weeks. And it was really about preparing for this something that God was moving me toward. Um, he connected me with women mentors who were proficient at preaching the gospel and I got to meet them, and I got to speak with them, so that was very helpful. On the, our second meeting, he said, Amory, you know, you need some books to st study God's word. So I ran out, and I got my books, and I brought them with me on our third meeting, and he gave me a crash course in studying these books. And, and some of the books he told me to get was the CBD Parallel Bible. He asked me to get the Bible Knowledge Commentary and then the Vines Complete Expository Dictionary and Manners and Customs. I mean, these were, I would, yeah, bring in my books. And he taught me really fast. And then I went ahead and continued on. Um, the vision from God, I was praying a lot, asking God, what do you want me to do? It was starting to take shape. Uh, I was talking to Andre about an outreach to seekers. And we, I was going to call this new thing Women of Worth. And uh, three days after our meeting, Andre prayed over me with my sisters, Gil Brewer, Felicia Ledger, and Nancy Gregg, right? A big, yeah. They're, mm -hmm. They prayed and they anointed me, and that's what I prayed God would do. And all of it was going good, and he was showing me things, right? And so then I had my fourth meeting with Andre. And in this meeting, sort of took a little turn, and he started to speak to me about my pride. I, I mean, I was like, huh, why in the world <laughs> would you ever speak to me about pride? You know, we were doing so good. <laughs> right? And I'm like, Andre says this, pride has no place in the ministry of God. And as I listened, obviously, I was like, ooch, ouch, ooch, I got pride. And he said, be humble, Amory, be weak, and God can do great things through you. And then he read 2 Corinthians 9, 10, and I'll just give you a little high view, but my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly will, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And look, I just sat there, and I, I, I was a bit confused. These were very foreign concepts to me, I, I, this pride thing. I mean, in the marketplace where I came from, it was all about my strength, my goals, my vision, right? Like, my ability. And everybody around me was about that too, right? Like, what do you mean you don't have pride? Of course we do. Anyways... What I realized in that moment was it was now becoming clear that being a minister of Jesus Christ is all about God and not about me, right? <laughs> and boy, that was a big, big lesson for me. Um, I also realized that what God, what God had put on my heart was weighty, like Andre said about the elders. There's a weight to and a responsibility to preaching the word of God. Right, and that's where the Lord was taking me. Uh, our fifth meeting and our last, Andre was definitely leaving for seminary in a few days, I think. Um, we realized that Women of Worth wasn't a small group, it was a ministry, and God launched it in 2004. And uh, it was awesome. I'm sorry, 2003. It's important these dates, right? I'm still just here as a parishioner. I get covering from my pastor. Andre leaves, he passes me off to David Owen, 
Good. I like Dave. Dave was awesome. And he would be my, he would, as Andre said, he gave me oversight. He way gave me oversight. He would check in, make sure things were going well. We started with 18 women. We ended up with 70 who met weekly, or bi-weekly rather, to hear the word of God. And they became believers, and many of them believers in Jesus Christ. And they were bridged to the local church. And I'll tell you what, I just loved that. I loved what God let me do. And I'll also say, I never asked my husband to ever cover me in the marketplace. I was good. No, no. But when it came to ministry, I asked my husband, please cover me. Please pray for me. Please let me come to you and tell you what I see. Please tell me, correct me. Please help me, because I don't know what I'm doing. I don't. I'm a woman who has all this marketplace stuff, and God's saying, I want you to minister. That was hard. Uh, it came to a point where in no November of 2004, so this was a, a while in, I remember prayed that prayer in 2001, and in one day, God shut down my business. So it had been three years, and beautiful business, and he's like, you're done. And I have David Owen to go talk to, and I let Dave know, hey, Dave, look what God did. You know, so he gave me an amazing business. We put Teresa through college, but he shut it down. I told him I'd do anything for him. And, you know, here it is three years later, and I wonder what he wants. So Dave in Dave's way, you know how Dave can be, like our blau, right? <laughs> he goes to me, well, Amory, I think... Jesus wants you to come on staff at the church. And I remember sitting in his office going, <laughs> in my head, I, I said, Jesus, I told you I'd do anything for you, but not this. <laughs> I don't want this. Right? <laughs> it's like too many ceilings for me. I was used to, you know, I was a big leader. I don't know. I'm, I'm not trying to offend anybody. This is just my story. And you know, I am like that, right? Like I built God design me this way. Anyways, I told Dave, I mumbled or stumbled or stuttered. I don't know. I was like, thank you, Dave. So appreciate you asking. But I don't think that's what Jesus has for me. And <laughs> that was in November. And I, uh, he goes, Amory, will you just promise me you'll pray? I go, okay. And then I thought, there's no way Rich Ainsworth is ever going to want me here. <laughs> and he goes, I'll call him. So five minutes after I got out the door, ring, ring. Amory, Rich is great. He's happy if you come. I'm like, oh my gosh. Okay, well, I'll keep praying. <laughs> and it was a real press. It was a real press that God was doing. He was changing me. Um, it would t I'll tell you, I did not say yes to the position for six months at this church. I, God had a lot to do in my life. Um, he showed me what it looked like to dance with Jesus and what it like to really be pressed in as one. And when you go and you, you do in the name of Jesus, we must be one with him. We must be one with our co-laborers in Christ. Um, one of my, I took a retreat. Um, every now and again, I would have Dave or Rich come up to me and say, hey, did you hear from the Lord yet? Are you coming? And I just wasn't ready. My entry said this, I had a life before you asked me to lay it down, Lord. It was a full life. What I didn't know is that my life didn't really matter that much. So now that you want me to go to places yet unknown to me, that's a great secret and mystery to me, and you know where I'm going and how I'll get there. And for the first time in my life, I don't have any idea what I'm doing. I, mm -mm. So I did say yes. Um, I got here in 2005, and it's been 19 years. I mean, I've had a glorious time in this church. I got initially hired as director of outreach. We took four Katrina trips to go rebuild Mississippi, and that was an awesome thing. Then they moved me into the interim director of youth, and I had Brian Fish in my youth group. I had Rick. Um, I'm sorry, Bryce Carlson, Rebecca Berger, my daughter. It was, there's many others in this church that were in that youth group at that, at that time. And then in 2008, 
they moved me into director of women's ministry, which had been my heart all along, all along. So I have had many opportunities to co-minister alongside of our church family and to lead in other churches too. And every year I'd evaluate with the Lord, Lord Jesus, is this really what you have for me? Do you have something new? Can I go? And every year he'd say, no, Amory, this is what I have for you, and just stay. And it, I kept asking year after year, and then one year I asked, Lord Jesus, you know, do you have something new for me? Can I go? And he said, no, Amory, this is what I have for you, and do not ask me again. <laughs> <laughs> so I never asked again. <laughs> And that was like 10 years ago. Um, so ladies, right, I'm up here because I love you and because you need to understand there's a pathway for you. There is a pathway, and we need to call minister as men and women in Christ for the fullness of God's glory to be revealed through the church, not just in here, but outside of the house, right? Um, I've been blessed, and I've been freely covered in my ministries, and I've taken this church some places like in the anti-trafficking movement. And even there was a moment when the church was like, Amory, this is beyond the church. And I knew it, but they still stayed in the gap and covered something called the underground New England. That was a big deal. I'm telling you now. And then we finally became a 501c3, and they were like, bye. No. <laughs> I'm telling you. Um, in my yielding, I've seen God move in wondrous ways. And I've seen beautiful things come from that. I've had to yield in this one place with women pastors and preachers, right? Because I feel led to be a pastor and I want to preach God's word. And I can do that because God gives me places for that, but it isn't on this mantle. And that has been hard for me. And I've had to yield my beliefs to the Lord and stand in the calling that he gave me at Wittenberry and stand united with Andre and the pastors and the elders, and that has been my joy. Because God told me to come here, and I didn't. I wouldn't have choose this, right? But that's what God has for me, and that's why I stay in place. So I, I guess what I would say in my yielding, I saw beautiful things that I never would have seen, and God did something beautiful. And I know we've all got some of that, maybe that we gotta yield. You don't, we don't agree with everything in this church or any other, um, if I had left, I would have missed things. Besides all of the ministries that God has allowed me to lead in this church in and out and to work alongside of leaders throughout the church, I would have missed getting my precious kidney from Kelly Sullivan. And that's why I'm alive today, because of this church and, and their prayers. Like, I would have missed all that. Yeah, praise be to God. Andre once described complementarianism, complementarianism as being co-equals, but with different roles, and I can live with that. I may have a different opinion on the matter of women pastors and preachers, but I am unified, as I already said. And lastly, ladies, I mean, I want anyone who's called to lead to know that we're here to help you to lead. And we want to have conversations about this, right? We're going to talk, Andre, we don't have a date yet, but we're hoping early May we'll gather together as leaders, women rather. You don't even have to be a leader, but we can talk through things. And Andre will be there, right? Just so that we can do this in a healthy way. Because God has a plan. That's the end of it. God has a plan. And if Jesus is calling you like he called me here, we got to do this together and we gotta yield a little bit, and on the other side will be something beautiful. It really has been an honor and a privilege. I, I mean, I had a big story, but I'm so grateful that God led me here, and I'm still here, and I won't be going anywhere. <laughs>
and you see how small I am? Yes. And I could go on and I on love about it. it, but... I love it, but what was great about that is I was in the middle of writing my sermon yeah. and decided on ballroom dancing as my lead thing. Oh, yeah. And then and she I didn't sends know. me this picture. Yeah. And I just, so, I just want to oh, twirl you, you around. There Whoa. you go. <laughs> So, yes, and yes. just want to say, we've been dancing for 19 years. Amen. He knows it. And just to correct, because this happens all the time, we're not husband and wife. No. <laughs> just I to can't. make that clear, because people mess that up all the time. All the time. It's so funny. Yeah. But Lord, we just thank yes, you for Lord. the opportunity to be mm. your people, Lord. And just like that picture shows, we as the church, Lord, our, our heart and our desire is to dance with you in such a way mm. that the world would say, look at how beautiful that is. Mm -hmm. And then we can say, it's all because of our beautiful God. Mm -hmm. God, I, we pray, would you help us, teach us to dance as best as we can, each one of us, Lord, and we pray that you would be glorified in all of it. Mm -hmm. So thankful, Lord, for Anne Marie, for mm -hmm. the women of this church, yeah. mm -hmm. Lord, for the elders and people who've led well, like Rich and Dave Owen and others through the mm -hmm. years, and Lord, continue to guide us, help us to dance well with you in Jesus' name, amen. amen. You are dismissed.